Hey everyone, welcome back to Computer Science 340. In the last video, we talked about trees and terminology along with trees. Then we talked about binary trees, which if you remember are a certain type of tree where every node has zero, one, or two children, but no more than that ever. And we talked about a couple of different uh, traversal methods where you can loop over all of the nodes in a binary tree. This week, we're gonna start talking about binary search trees, which are a special type of binary trees, just like binary trees are a special type of trees in general. In a binary search tree, we have some additional rules for the way that nodes are laid out. And specifically, it is about the values that are stored inside of the nodes. So we're gonna talk about how we lay out a binary search tree to follow those rules, which we'll explain. And then we'll talk about algorithms to insert new data into a binary search tree, and then also to search for data that's already stored in the binary search tree. Binary search trees, as you can tell from the name binary search, are really, really related to the binary search algorithm that we covered last week. So the binary search algorithm, if you remember, is a really efficient big O of log n um, method for searching data. The goal of a binary search tree is to basically have a data structure that you can binary search really easily. So we'll talk about how we set up the binary search tree in such a way that it allows for the binary searching to happen. So let's take a look at the rules for binary search trees first. Okay, so here is a picture of a binary search tree. As you can see, it's a type of tree, obviously, with a root, which we're drawing up here at the top and it is a binary tree because none of the nodes have more than two children. And it is also a binary search tree, which it means that it follows a few other rules. The first rule is that for every node in the tree, all of the nodes in the left subtree contain values only less than the node we're looking at. So let me explain what I mean by that. If we look at any node, we can start with the root node of 51. It means that all of the nodes in the entire left subtree have values less than 51, which if you look at it, that's the case. That also has to be true though for every other node in the tree. So if we look at this one, the 72, everything in the left subtree of 72 is also less than 72. If we look at the 34 node, everything in the left subtree of 34 has to be less than 34. The other rule is the opposite one of this. Everything in the right subtree of a given node has to have values greater than this. So we can look at this one as well. Again, if we're looking at 51 as the root node, everything in the right subtree has to have a value greater than 51, which we, if we look at it, that's the case. And like the other rule, this rule is like recursive. It applies to every other node in the tree. So if we look at the 20 node, everything in the right subtree of this has to be bigger than 20. If we look at the 60 node, everything in the right subtree of the 60 has to be greater than 60 and so on for all the other nodes. And then the last rule is just that you don't have any repeated items. So every piece of data stored in the binary search tree has to be unique. So let's think for a moment about why these rules are here. Like I said in the intro, the point of this data structure is to run the binary search algorithm on it. And in binary search, if you remember, you start looking in the middle of the data structure, and then you, based on the value that you find there, either narrow it down to the left half or the right half. So that's the whole goal of the binary search tree is to run the binary search algorithm. So if we want to search for a piece of data, like let's say we're searching for uh, the 28, then we're going to start in the root node here. And because of these rules, we know that we can compare the thing we're looking for, which is 28, to the thing we find here, the 51. And because 28 is less than 51, and because of these three rules, we know that the 28 has to be in the left subtree. So that will cause us to move down here to node 20. Now we again compare the thing we're looking for, 28, to the value we find here, which is the 20, and we see that 28 is bigger than 20, so we conclude that what we're looking for has to be in the right subtree of 20. Now we're on the 34 node, and we're looking for 28, which is less than 34, so we know that it has to be in the left subtree, which moves us down here, and then lo and behold, we found the thing we're looking for. And so the goal of binary search trees, again, is to run the binary search algorithm, which if we remember is big O log of n. We're going to return to the analysis for this in terms of binary search trees specifically later on in this week, 
but uh, that's the goal is to have these very efficient binary searches possible. But you might ask, why don't we just use an array? Because if you keep your array sorted, then you can use binary search. But the reason for that is because if you're inserting into a sorted array, that's not terribly efficient. So like if we have this array storing the same data that's in the binary search tree, and we want to insert a new value, like let's say we want to insert 17 into this data structure, if we're using the sorted array approach, well, we would have to put the 17 into this slot, which means that we would have to shift everything else in the array down by one in order to make a gap here, freeing up this slot for the 17 to go into, which is going to be big of n. We have to potentially move the whole array, or at least on average, half the array every time we do an insert. Binary search trees are more efficient to insert data into than a sorted array. Let's talk about how we would insert the number 17 into the binary search tree. Well, it's actually really similar to the binary search algorithm itself. We start looking in the middle, and we know that based on this number, we'll either have to go left or right. 51 is bigger than 17, so 17 will have to go into the left subtree, so we move down to the left child. Then we do the same thing. We compare 17 with 20 and see that 17 is less than 20, so again, we have to move down to the left child. We do the same thing here, comparing 17 to 8, and find that 17 is bigger, so this time we move to the right child. Now we do the same thing again and look and compare 15 to 17. 17 is bigger, so we move down to the right child of 15, but see that there is no right child, so that's the place where we have to insert the 17 into. So in doing the insert, we're basically like binary searching for where the data is supposed to go and then put it in the spot that we should have been finding it in. So the insert is also sort of big O of log n. Again, we'll return to the analysis in a little more detail later on this week, but that's the idea behind the binary search tree. We want to be able to search really quickly using the binary search algorithm. And we also want to insert really quickly by basically using the same algorithm, which is more efficient than doing it with a sorted array. So that's the idea behind binary search trees. Let's go ahead and jump into some code for these. All right, so here we have a skeleton program that we're going to begin working with as we fill in code for doing the searches and the inserts and the other things we need this class to do. We made this a generic class so that the binary search tree can store any type of data at all, except we did something that we haven't done yet with generic types, which is that we've specified that not just any type can be filled in here, but something that extends the comparable interface. So in Java, if you remember, every class inherits directly or indirectly from the object class, and object gives you some things you can call upon it, like you can call dot equals on any class in Java because the object class has a dot equals method. And you can also call upon a hash code method for every object in Java because that's also in the object class. But we, in doing our binary search tree, don't just need to see if two pieces of data are equal to each other or not. We need to also see if they're less than or greater than each other. Both the search and the insert algorithm need that to happen. And so not just any old class can be stored in your binary search tree. It has to be something that you can say if it's less than or greater than another thing of the same class. And so the dot compare to method in Java that you can call upon for like strings to do alphabetical sorting or integers or whatever comes from this uh, comparable class. And so we will say basically by putting this in here that only classes that inherit from comparable or comparable can be put inside of the binary search tree. So that's just a new little wrinkle with Java we haven't seen yet. Then inside of this binary search tree class, I already put some stuff in here so we wouldn't have to go through all of it from scratch. We have our class node, which contains a piece of data of whatever type that inherits from uh, comparable that we put in. Then we have references to the left child and the right child. And then this class has a little constructor just to go ahead and save us from having to say left child equals null, right child equals null every time we make a node object and we just put the data inside of it. Just like the linked list classes that we've developed only store the head or sometimes the tail of the linked list, the binary search tree only stores a direct reference to the root node. In order to get to the other nodes, we have to like traverse through the tree from the root to get to where we want to go. 
And then we have a constructor that just sets the root equal to null, just like for a linked list when we set the head and tail equal to null in the constructor. So that's all we have sort of already built for us. Then I went ahead and made two little skeleton methods for our insert method. Just like our binary search recursive algorithm and our merge sort recursive algorithm, we have sort of two methods here. This often happens in recursion, at least in Java, because Java doesn't give you default um, parameter values like some other languages like Python and C++ do. So in Java, we have to sort of make two methods here. The first is the one that the user will call directly that just takes the value that we want to insert into the tree. And this one just calls upon the real insert method saying to insert starting at the root node. The insert at method returns a node itself because we might have to create the very first node in the tree, in which case we're going to return the root node back. So we take whatever insert at returns and sets it into the root node. So insert at returns the tree back. And that's because when the thing first starts out, the root is going to be null. So we need to have some way of setting the root. So insert at inserts the node into the tree that we have so far, whatever might be here, and returns the root node back again. So let's start coding the insert at method. Like I said, we're going to look at the node we've been given, and this is going to start as the root node, but eventually it'll work down to the sub nodes as well. We need to look at this and see if the value we're inserting is supposed to go on the left side or the right side. So we'll say something like, if the node here's data, we have to compare it to the value that we're inserting. So that's why we inherited from this comparable thing so that we can call this compare to method. And so the way that this compare to method works in Java is it returns a negative number if value is bigger than node.data. So if the thing you pass in is bigger than the one you call it upon, it returns to you a negative number. So I'll say if this is less than zero, then we need to put it on the right side. We'll talk about how to do that in a sec. Otherwise, if it returns a positive number, then we're going to put it on the left side. And it shouldn't return zero because that would mean that the two things are exactly equal, which we're going to assume doesn't happen. So then what we're going to do is in order to put it in on the right side, we're going to call ourselves recursively with the same value, but instead of putting it at this node, we're going to put it at this node's right child. But the way that insert works is it has to build up the data structure as well as it's going. So we're going to actually set node.write equal to what this insert call returns because it's possible that we don't have a right child. And so in that case, what would happen is we would make a new node there and return it back up. And so we need to actually stick it on to the right child. Then left is going to be very much the same, except we're going to say node.left equals insert at same value, but we're inserting it on the left side this time. Then we return this node back up to whoever called us. So on your recursion lab uh, that you did a couple weeks ago, one of the things that pe some people struggled with was returning data back from the recursive method. You know, you called the recursive method okay, but sometimes it can be hard to remember how to chain the data back up with the return calls. And so this is not exactly like trivial what's happening here, but the insert at method is responsible for returning the data back up to whoever called it. Sometimes that's going to be an, a node that already existed, and sometimes it's going to be a new node, but we return the node back up and set it into the one that we called it upon in order to make sure that the new data that's created is actually linked up to the tree. So we've got the recursive part of this happening now, except we don't have any base case. We're just going to go left and right and left and right and left and right. But if you think about it, the base case is when you are called upon a node that doesn't exist. So if we were going to look at another example of this real quick, if we were going to insert the number like, let's say 45, then we would look here and go left. Then we would look here and go right then we would go right again, and then we would go right again, and then we would be called on a null node. The right child of the 40 node is equal to null. So if that happens, that's when we need to make a new node and return it back up again. So looking at the data, 
we will have to put our base case in here and say if the node that we're called on is actually equal to null, then what we're going to do is we're going to return a new node with this value. And because we're returning it and then hooking it back up to the tree in the right spot, we're going to make sure that that new node is actually attached. So that's all there is to this insert and insert at methods. So we should go ahead and see about testing these. And in order to do that, we'll talk about how to traverse a binary search tree. All right, so last time we talked about traversals and one of the ones we did was the in-order traversal, which if you remember is the one where we handle the left subtree, then the node itself, then the right subtree. Well, this has an interesting property when combined with binary search trees. We talked about the in-order traversal in some detail last time, so I'm not gonna repeat all of the steps of the algorithm like super slowly, but basically we're gonna start at the 51, then we go left to the 20, left to the eight, left to the two. Two has no left child, so then we do two itself, then the right child of two, and then back up here to eight. And so then we will handle the eight node, then the right child of that gives us the 15, then we'll do the 17. Then we've handled this whole left subtree. So we come back up here and do the 20. And then we do the left subtree of 20, which gives us eventually to the 28, then the 34, then the 40. Then we've handled the whole left subtree of the root node. So we do the root node itself. Then the right side of that. And of course, we'll start by going left and go to the 57, then the 60, 65, 72, 78, 89, 93. Again, I went through that pretty quickly, but if you look at it, what's happened here is that we've hit all of the nodes in order. So if we do an in-order traversal of a binary search tree, it gives us the numbers back out in sorted order. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the in-order traversal into our binary search tree class so that we can actually test that like stuff is getting inserted correctly, because if it is, then it should come out in sorted order. Okay, so let's go ahead and write an in-order traversal here. One thing that I've done is I've made the insert at method private, and I'll make the recursive in-order traversal method private as well, because those don't really need to be called by outside users. We'll just make a separate print method that just starts us off on the root node. So I'll say in-order print, oops, at a given node. To do that, we say if the node doesn't equal null, then do these three things. The first one is to in order print the left subtree. Then we do the same thing with the right subtree. And in the middle, we're going to actually print this one itself. So I'll go ahead and print the node.data inside of here. And that's the end of the method. So the same thing we talked about last time. And now I'll make a public method for this that is called print that just prints out the tree. So I'll say public void print just calls in order print starting at the root node. So again, we have this private method that does the real actual recursive work with a parameter and then a public one that just calls upon that starting at the root method. So in order to test this, I came up with this little test program that makes a binary search tree of integers and then it rolls through an array of numbers and inserts all of them. And so if you look, these are not in sorted order, they're just kind of randomly put in. Then we call our print method. So if everything works well, this should actually sort of serve as a sorting algorithm, right? Because if I insert all of these into the binary search tree following the rules, then as we saw, the in order traversal should print them out in order. So if we run this, we see that that is the case. So it looks like our tree is getting built correctly and is doing the inserting using the right logic. All right, the next thing to turn our attention to is the search algorithm. All right, so in order to do this, we're gonna do the same thing where we make a private method that's recursive that takes the node we're searching at and a public method that doesn't take a parameter that the user can call like this. And now let's start with the public one first. First of all, you might think it's kind of kind of stupid that it takes in the thing we're searching for and it only just returns back the thing we're searching for. That might feel like a waste, like why search for it if you already know what it is? But there's a few reasons for that. For one is that it'll return null if the thing isn't found. And the second one is because the way that people often use things like this is, let's say the type thing is like a student record. 
Well, what you can do is you can have the one you pass in, the target one, be empty except for the comparison thing. So let's say that we, the way we compare student records is with the student ID number. Well, then you can make like a dummy student record and just fill in the ID number you want, but like the name and the grades and all the other stuff that's stored, address, phone number is all empty. Then you search with the one that just has an ID number and nothing else. And then the one you get back has the same ID number, but all the other stuff is filled in. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to call the recursive one and save the node that it returns. So we'll say the node is equal to the result of calling search at with this target starting at the root node. Then we'll say that if that node is equal to null, then that means it wasn't found. So we should return null as well. Otherwise, we'll return the data that was stored inside of this node, node.data. And I think that should do it for this. Then the recursive one is more fun. This is basically doing the same binary search algorithm we already talked about. And if you remember, we have a couple of cases. What we're going to do is we're going to compare the target we're looking for, for the node's data. And so the first thing that might be the case is it might actually be the one we're looking for. So I'll say if the node data equals the target that we're looking for, then we found the thing and we should return this node back. Otherwise, another option is if this node's value is less than the target. So to do that again, I'm going to say if node.data dot compare to the target value we're looking for. If that is less than zero, so if that returns a negative number, then what that means is that target is bigger and so we have to search on the right. So again, the returns are really important when you're doing recursive stuff. I'm supposed to be returning the node we eventually find. So I can't just call search at on the right. I have to return what search at returns when I call it on the right. So I'm going to pass the same target and node.write for the node that we're searching for. Then the else has to be that the thing is on the other side. So I'll just go ahead and do the same thing here, except on the left side. So we only have one last thing to worry about here, which is what happens when we don't find the thing we're looking for ever and we run off the end of the binary search tree. Well, in that case, what will happen is we'll call one of these two recursive methods to search on either the right or the left side. And in that case, the left reference or the right reference will be null. So it could happen that we'll get down to this method and have null for our node right here. And so if that happens, we will have node being equal to null. And in that case, we should just return null because the thing is not going to be found. So I'll add that case in there and I guess I can coalesce these together. So if the node is null, it's not here, return null. If the node is equal to the one we're looking for, return this node because we found it. Then check if the thing that is here is less than the one we're looking for. And if that is the case, then we will search on the right side. Otherwise, it must have been bigger than the one here, so we're going to search on the left side. I think that should do it. Let's go ahead and test this. All right, so in order to test this, I added some code to our little test program. I went ahead and made a scanner and read in numbers until the user puts in something that's zero or, or less. And for each number that they put in, we search our tree for it. If it's not equal to null, we print yes. And if it is equal to null, we print no. This will just let us put in these numbers and it should return yes if they are in the tree or no if they're not. So if we go ahead and run this again, now it prints out the data that is there. I'll go ahead and put in a number that is there, like 32, and it prints yes. 99 prints yes, 81 prints yes. So it does seem to be finding our data. And if I put in something that isn't there, like three, it should say no, or 75 says no, 33 says no, all those things. And so I think that our search is working. The code for it here, again, it's very similar in spirit and uh, in operation to the binary search algorithm that works on an array, except instead of like finding the middle of the array, we just look at the node we're currently on and then go left or right based on that to the different subtrees. So the notes page for this lesson has the 
rules for the binary search tree, and it has the algorithms and code for doing both the insert and the search operations recursively. We have two more things left to talk about in this week. The next one we're going to tackle is the remove algorithm. And then after that, we're going to do some analysis about how well the binary search tree does and different ways we can improve their performance. But that's all for now. Thanks.